The Bible isn't the only thing that changed in the 4th century, and in this episode we look at the genesis of the cross as a symbol and explore a new way to reconnect with the pre-Nicene Christians and learn the meaning behind the first Christian symbol. The latest news, history, and analysis from the perspective of the first Christians. Tune into the FBN Worldwide 24-7 radio stream. If your father died in a car crash, would you remember him by carrying around a picture of the crumpled wreckage in your wallet? Maybe talking to your children about their grandfather and slowly pull out the picture of the car accident and re remember him in hushed tones. No, probably not. That would be a little macabre, a little creepy, definitely awkward and strange. And it's exactly the reaction the first Christians, the pre-Nicene Christians, would have had if people started wearing crosses or using them as symbols to represent Christ. It would have been off-putting, to say the least. For them, Jesus and his life and teachings were all about his resurrection and redemptive power, not staring at the handiwork tied directly to his death, but staring at the car accident. And there's an even more disturbing angle to the background of the story as well. The enemies of Christ and Christianity, the murderers of Jesus, probably took a certain satisfaction, a silent mockery, if you will, with the use of the cross to represent Christ. For them, it represented the sacrifice of an animal, no different. Ask yourself why directors of porn and gangster rap videos insist the talent wear not just crosses, but gaudy, oversized crosses to really drive home the humiliation and mockery. Now imagine if the same thing were done with their religious symbols. Oh my, the worldwide uproar that would ensue 24-7. It would make the deranged screaming of the COVID cult pale in comparison. I can assure you that if they pulled a stunt like that with crosses in the days of the pre-Nicene Christians, the dogs would find the remains too small to bother scavenging. And even a hundred years ago now, I think that would have been the case. But we live in different times now, much more accepting of being mocked and our religion blasphemed. In fact, today, most of us would just roll up our sleeves and let the enemy inject us with a DNA mutating bioweapon, willingly letting the very enemies of Christianity pervert his perfect creation on a genetic level. So, no, nobody was using crosses to represent and celebrate Christ in the pre-Nicene era immediately following the crucifixion and resurrection. That era, or as it came come to be known as the cross craze, wouldn't come until hundreds of years later. Now, if you're a regular listener, it will come as no surprise that we go into these episodes as innocent lambs right up until the 4th century. See, that was an incredibly unfortunate century for the first Christians. We sometimes call it the Great Inversion or the Great Perversion. You see, it was when there was a great replacement and bending and shifting of reality in erasure of the true past. It was when the Hebrew Bible, or Torah, was renamed, rebranded as the Old Testament and stapled onto a new version of the Bible. Of course, the Gospel of the Lord was done away with entirely, with only fragments of it allowed to, to remain in the modern Bible. It was when all of the original Greek writings were translated into Latin. And of course, when you want to change and edit text and meaning, it's during translations that are the golden opportunity to do so. It was also when the original symbol of Christianity was replaced with a new one. Now, Americans of today are getting a close-up look at how the inversion-perversion reset process works as they watch their history and culture being erased right before their eyes. Statues honoring past heroes are now covered with a tarp and taken away by trucks in the middle of the night. And it happens fast. History erased like it never happened. Entire subjects at public schools erased from the curriculum. That's what these resets look like. And as usual, we kick over the 4th century woodpile and find the usual suspects hissing in fear at the sudden bright light. 
in this story was no different. And amazingly, by sheer coincidence, of course, our story begins one year after the debacle and travesty of the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. It is then we are told that Emperor Constantine's mother has decided to suddenly take it upon herself to journey to Jerusalem. And according to the story, the divorced Empress Helena has a suspicion that the cross used to crucify Christ is buried under a pagan temple. She discovers three crosses, but is unsure of which is the one used for Jesus. So she has a woman who's sick and near death brought from a nearby village. She tells the woman to touch each cross so that she can observe her reaction. And upon touching the third cross, the woman is miraculously healed and Empress Helena announces that she has now found the true cross. Now, somewhat predictably, this sparks a craze in holy relics, and let's be honest, it also sparks a fevered interest in Christianity in general. The Empress and Emperor are now fully on board. Later, the Bishop of Jerusalem would conduct elaborate ceremonies where the faithful would kiss and pray with the wood fragments. Unfortunately, the bishop also introduced some Judaizing elements to the ceremony, as we learn in a letter from a nun who took notes at the proceedings. Here's what she had to say. After the people kiss the wood, they are led to a deacon who stands holding the ring of Solomon and the horn used to anoint Jewish kings. They then, and I quote, kiss the horn and gaze at the ring, unquote. Now, I'll have a link in the show notes for the letter, and I ask you, what would the Apostle Paul have said if he had seen such a craven, Judaized, iconic display? Now, what should have been just a benign, reverential act, a simple adoration of the wood, and with it the memory of Christ's sacrifice for all of us, turned into a bizarre worshipping of Jewish rings and horns at the end. And we see this same perversion play out in so many areas throughout history. Just prior to this, at the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, the Torah, renamed the Old Testament, was stapled onto the Christian Bible in a violent act. And that council, by the way, was invitation only. And anyone who objected to the emperor's final decision faced banishment from the empire. And many were as a result. When we do this forced grafting of Christianity onto the corrupt Judaized tree, why are we surprised when the result is always corrupt fruit? Now, look around you. Look at the state and decay of mainstream Christian denominations today. Simply put, it's a theological freak show. But we, as pre-Nicene Christians with faith founded on the original Christian Bible, remain above the fray as we reach our hand out to save other Christians, to pluck them from the confused and icy waters of the spiritual Dead Sea, and then wrap them in the blanket of the gospel of the Lord. This is our obligation, the offering of our hand, but they must decide that they want to take it. In any event, over time, we came to be where we are now, the cross as the common symbol for all Christians. And by the way, this isn't a cross-bashing episode. Even the Marcionite Church uses the cross and performs the sign of the cross. But we have to know our past to know how we got here. In fact, the Bible tells us it is our obligation to seek the truth and hold fast onto what is good. But wait a minute, you might say. What about the hundreds of years before the cross became popular? What about when Christians were being fed to lions and hunted by Pharisees, praying in secret in the catacombs, in the ones that were allowed to worship openly? Surely they used a symbol of some kind to represent they were Christians. Well, yes, and you'd be right, and this is the point of the episode. The symbol they used for themselves and to identify other Christians during these dangerous times times, by the way, no different from what we live in now, were two simple Greek letters, the P and the X. The X superimposed on the stem of the letter P, also called a key row. Now, 
These are the first two Greek letters for the name of Christ, and for them it represented the resurrection of Jesus and our salvation. It represented an uplifting message and inspired hope for those facing death. Now, it is interesting, is it not, how those epistles of Paul written in Greek, the first symbol of Christians, also in Greek, were changed into and translated into Latin. A Greek Bible revealing the Christian God revealed to us only through Jesus becomes the Latin Vulgate with a Torah stapled onto it. The symbol of a risen Christ with Greek letters becomes a Latin cross, instantly reminding us of death and the crude structure used to crucify our Lord. Now, this is a good time to reflect on 1 Corinthians 5, 6 through 7. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. And let me tell you something, in the 4th century, there was a whole lot of leavening going on in that lump. And as you look around at these decimated churches of today, do they not remind us of wood that has been eaten away by termites with only the thin skin of the paint remaining? Or when they grafted Christianity onto a Judaized corrupt tree, why do they now wonder why it only bears corrupt fruit? And as always, we find our answers in the first Christian Bible of 144 AD. You can get a free copy at the very first Bible.org.org. Personally, I think that Christian symbol needs to make a comeback, don't you? I'll have a link in the show notes where you can download the uh, graphics associated with it. Why not share them on social media or have them around you? Give them to others. Maybe add them to a simple email signature. Now, the Marcionite Church puts a small cross at the base of the key row symbol, in effect showing the greater power of Christ's resurrection over the crude cross of death. May our Father send his Holy Spirit to guide you in all things, and that the teachings of Jesus Christ be with you always. Remember, seek the truth and hold fast to that which is good.